Hello, and like the last two speakers, this is my first CanMed uh, talk, so I am delighted to be here, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators on this project. Dewey Trent is an undergraduate researcher in my laboratory. He did the work on the army worms that we'll discuss later. Uh, Tony Wong is a professor and an institute professor at the University of Tennessee in the Department of Food Science. She and her lab came up with the technology to make the nano emulsions. And Zach Hansen is a uh, plant pathologist, and he did the work on powdery mildew. He was at the University of Tennessee, and now he's associated with Cornell University. Um, we hear a lot in this uh, conference about the importance of hemp and the importance to human health. It's also very important for animal health. So if we look at the one health con concept, where I want to focus our talk today is on the third component, which is the environmental health. In hemp, we have uh, very good products. We have the cannabinoids, and, but we also have a lot of other things that are produced. So we have the spent hemp, is, which is now being used in many states as animal feed. It can also be used to generate fibers. Uh, grow, extractors recycle their solvents. So the things that are left over are what we are using and that is the small amount here, which is the byproduct of hemp extraction. So if we can find a good use for this, then we will have completed the entire cycle for uh, this particular plant so it has little or no environmental impact. So that's what we decided to take on. We took the hemp plant, we went to the extractors, and uh, they took the products, and we took what was left over. I've often called this our leftovers uh, project. We submitted that to uh, a microfluidizer with uh, grass uh, surfactants. Grass simply means generally regarded as safe. This is an incredibly safe product. You could eat it but I don't recommend it. But, uh, so what we did in the microfluidizer is make, simply make this into a nano emulsion. These are very, very small molecules suspended in a liquid. If you think about salad dressing, when you mix oil and water, when you do that, you get that quick emulsion. Well, this is a stable emulsion that looks similar to that. Uh, what's in that emulsion is whatever is left over. Uh, in this first batch, it was very high still in the cannabinoids. That particular extractor didn't have a uh, good extraction of the full C uh, CBD. That was mainly CBD. So, so we did um, a distillation to get rid of the cannabinoids and really con uh, concentrate on the terpenes because the terpenes are the things that we are interested in for insecticidal and fungicidal products. So if we look at what happened to our DPT, which is this distilled uh, terpenes, we are mostly uh, caryophylline, bisabol, and hubiline, all sesquiterpenes. The minor terpenes included mostly the monoterpenes and uh, some other terpenoids. And I'm using terpene and terpenoid interchangeably in this talk. They aren't the same, and I, and I understand that. So it, I'll, throughout the talk, I'll use several abbreviations. One is DPT, and that is our dis distilled byproduct. Uh, TP, which is our crude byproduct. NE is simply our negative control, which is uh, surfactant only, no terpenes. And NEEM, which is our positive control, <coughs> it is a well-regarded uh, biopesticide. So one of the problems with natural products is shelf life. So with the um, nano emulsion, we get a stable product. It does get a little cloudy after 30 days, but I've used some of these products up to six months to two years, and it's still, they still have activity. Um, 
it's hard to see on this thing, but there's a little tiny yellow bar there that is 20 microns. So these are very, very small molecules uh, of these nano emulsions, these, liquid, these surfactants and terpenes together suspended in water. So our first experiment was just a proof of concept. So we worked with bean beetle. We work with bean beetle for two reasons. Uh, it's available commercially, it's easy to get, it's easy to rear, and it's a model insect for testing this type of thing. It is, uh, what we did is we put the beans in, the, in a flask, uh, then put that out on a piece of uh, filter paper after we dried them. We put two pairs of uh, beetles in there so they would mate, and then we allowed them <clears throat> to lay their eggs on the surface. This particular insect lays its eggs, and then the larvae bury into the bean itself, completely making the bean uh, unacceptable for com consumption. <clears throat> and then at the end, we did a number of things. We counted the numbers of eggs and everything. But what I'm going to report today is basically our data on uh, how many adults emerged. But all this data is published. in the paper Faye uh, et al. So basically what we saw was with the, we treated only with a nano emulsion. We got about 15 adults uh, per dish that came out. Whereas when we put these other uh, treatments on there, we, we lowered the amount uh, with a 5% TP and a 5% uh, DTP. So we were very excited about this. We thought this is a great way to um, start to thinking about this as a potential uh, control for this pest. This pest can cause a 90% loss of uh, cowpeas in, uh, in storage. So it's very important for people who are legume storage producers. Uh, we looked at that in terms of the economic loss. This follows the exact same data trend as the adults per dish. And basically, uh, we see that if we had the uh, economic loss of about, you know, 40% with the nano emulsion alone, then we were down to less than 5% with our best treatment, which was the 5% uh, DTP. So at the time, uh, Zach Hansen's uh, graduate student uh, was dealing with some powdery mildew of hemp. He was running uh, trials, so we said, oh, can we put this in your trial? So in the first trial, we had the TP in the trial, but we did not have the NE because we were just jumping into the experiment midway. And anyway, so if we look at the area under the disease progress curve, which is a common way that plant pathologists measure how much disease is there, then we see that um, in the water we had a very high response, but with the, the biopesticides that he tested, uh, and this was strictly biopesticides, we saw a reduction uh, of our material very, very similar to that of the common biopesticides that are used to treat powdery mildew in hemp. In the second run of this, the second trial, we actually looked at uh, our nano emulsion and we saw the same type of response with our nano emulsion alone and uh, also our nano emulsion with the terpene. So we feel very confident that this is a great way to control powdery mildew of hemp. And <clears throat> we uh, decided to go a little bit further. <clears throat> but by this time, we needed to get a new formulation. So we went to another extractor, so we have no control over what's coming into our system. So the first thing we did was uh, look at this. This time we sent it off to a company, New Bloom in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we found that basically in this time we have very few cannabinoids and mostly sesquiterpenes. So we decided to use this without doing the distillation because the distillation if you're coming into product formulation is a very expensive uh, process. So we decided to look at uh, pathogens and pests. So the pathogen is uh, powdery mildews, another powdery mildew. 
And then we decided to look at caterpillars or Lepidopteran larvae. So with the powdery mildew of squash, if you aren't a plant pathologist, you probably don't know this, but powdery mildews are very specific to their host. So uh, this is not the same as the powdery mildew of hemp, uh, but we got the same response. In this experiment, though, we did add some chemical controls. These are shown in green. The other biopesticides are shown in gold, and ours is in this deep orange. And we basically got, with our TP, we got as good a control as you get with a synthetic pesticide. So once again, this tells us that we are doing the right thing to control powdery mildews. Uh, and we can get a somewhat of a benefit if we have the TP in there compared to the nano emulsion, but that difference is not statistically significant, but it is also not statistically significant from the best uh, powdery mildew uh, product that we could find at that time. So we uh, went to a different system looking at uh, toxicity. So this is if we feed it to the insect, we make them eat it, what happens? And in this case, we used the nano emulsions. We incorporated it into artificial diet. This artificial diet was used to rear the, rear, the insects from third instar, which is the hardest instar, one of the harder instars to kill. Most people start do this in very early instars. And then uh, we fed this and we watched what happened. And in this uh, study, we had water as our control, we had a uh, nano emulsion control, and we had two doses of the TP and the nano emulsion, a low dose and a high dose. And we did not see any statistical difference in the uh, mortality of the insects in the low dose, but in the high dose we did. So this high dose is, uh, very, would be very important for using to control fall armyworm. Uh, if you don't know about fall armyworm, fall armyworm is a very invasive pest. You can, in the U.S., it's estimated to uh, cause losses of about $200 million. And that is uh, one of the reasons we targeted it, also because it is also a, a model insect and we can compare to a lot of other studies. So we also decided to look at bead armyworm. Bead armyworm is a very close relative of the fall armyworm, uh, different, different species in the same genus. And the bead armyworm, there was no impact. So we don't have a good explanation for this as of yet. We are, we are looking at some of the digestive enzymes and this type of thing that would uh, help, help us get a clue, but we don't have a reason for this yet, so we're trying to, to, uh, to find that out. But it is also not a real significant pest of crops in the U.S. The last thing I'm going to talk about is a, uh, we started looking at, well, if, if a uh, biotrophic pathogen is uh, affected, how, what is the effect on a, a pathogen like fusarium? And so we did what we call a poison food study. Poison food studies are simply, in this case, we took the emulsion, we spread it across the top of the uh, media, and then we put a plug of fusarium in the center and monitored its growth. And in this experiment, uh, the first time we used a fusarium oxysporum, and it is an isolate that, that we received from uh, Bonnie only, and it is an isolate that was derived from strawberries. And we measured the days. Each day we measured the colony growth. And it became very obvious that we did have a reduction in growth, but the reduction in growth is, is consistent. So on day two, day three, uh, the nano emulsion is equal to the uh, TP on day four, four, and that trend consists all the way through. So we really don't think this is a great product to control something like fusarium, uh, but 
It does slow it down, but it doesn't really control it. So we went to an isolate that we have from hemp. It is probably a sporotricheoides, and asked the same question, got exactly the same result. So while I think this is a great pesticide for the, for the powdery mildews, being able to treat something, the forfusarium, um, may not work. Uh, we are currently looking at this as a seed treatment and seeing uh, what happens when we put uh, fusaria, seed that has fusaria into the uh, treatment and see if we can get rid of fusarium that way. So in summary, we've had two proofs of concept. With the first proof of concept, we had that there was activity against the bean beetle and it was basically ask, acting as a repellent in that system. In the second, we looked at toxicity, and it is toxic to fall armyworm. Uh, we looked in both cases, we looked at fungicidal activity on a powdery mildew, remembering that these are different organisms, and powdery mildew was uh, of hemp. The, we had almost complete control, and that was equal to any biopesticide that was on the market at the time. And in the um, acorn squash powdery mildew, we had uh, consistent with what we, someone would use with if they were using what was available as the best powdery mildew control at that time. So in summary, what I have been saying is that we do have uh, byproducts from CBD extraction. We can create a use for these products using the nano emulsion technology and it's active against some insects and some pathogens. It's not a universal uh, insecticide or a universal fungicide, but it, we can do acceptable applications. Uh, we work very hard to get, uh, con use concentrations that are not phytotoxic. If you know anything about putting terpenes on plants, terpenes are very phytotoxic when you apply them to the surface. So we have to, to work on adjusting that, but we've got those levels at this point, and we have a great potential, I think, for a biopesticide uh, development from him. Uh, like Mike, I'm looking, I'm came looking for potential collaborators and and, uh, and money to take this uh, technology further. And. At that point, I just wanted to say that this, if we can develop this, we can use this product, then we can close the loop and make cannabis one of the few crops that can be fully uh, fulfill the goals of the One Health initiatives. Thank you. Thank you for this nice presentation, but I was a little bit confused because we have many uh, cannabis cultivars very rich in terpenes, very, very, very rich in terpenes, mm -hmm. but 100% susceptible to poetry mildew. But now we are saying using the same terpenes, we can control the poetry mildew, how that works. We are, we are working on, I think your question is, can we just use the terpenes and do this? No, I'm saying we have the plants that they are rich in terpenes. They are you know, naturally producing the terpenes in a very high level, but they are completely susceptible to poetry and mildew, as an example. Yes. But yes, and we don't know why, because when we first did the, the hemp experiment, I fully expected it, the powdery mildew, to not have any response at all. Um, but it is, I think, uh, kind of related to the fact that we have the anana emulsion in there, and that allows a different uh, uptake by the pathogen than if it's just exposed to the, the terpenes in the glands in like the hemp. So I think that it's a, it's a, it's a matter of exposure and how much is uptake by the, fun, by the fungus. I think there's a, there was somebody over here. Did you have a question? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Dr. Gwynn. Uh, for your fusarium studies, did you perform a concentration dependence uh, 
study using the hemphloride biopesticide? We did not use a, we did not do a concentration study. What we did is we took the same amount that we knew was not phytotoxic and the, the same concentration that we used on the powdery mildew, on the plants for powdery mildew. Anything above that was phytotoxic. So we, didn't, we also didn't see how low we could go, but since, since we didn't gr get great responses with the highest concentration that we felt we could use, we didn't pursue it any further. <clears throat> now, we don't have that kind of data for seeds and, seed, and the effects on seed germination, so we will be using higher concentrations in those studies. I have a question over here. Excuse me? Yes. Here. here. Yeah. Ah. Hi. Hi. Wonderful talk. I have a ton of questions and um, focusing on the application um, methodologies where um, ha are you or have you looked at uh, with regard to seed uh, fumigant versus uh, seed coating or delivery to plants, soil drenching effects versus leaf spraying effects and influences on mycorrhizal and beneficial we have not looked at, at, at beneficials, uh, and we are in the first stages of the seeds. What we are finding, because of some of my other interests in other bioactive products, we've been looking at hemp seed uh, and fusarium, and we find that if we do a, a, a surface sterilization of seed, we still have fusarium. So we are uh, concerned about that as a transmission and, <clears throat> excuse me, and so we are hoping that if we can soak them in this with the nano emulsion, and, uh, and it won't be toxic to seed germination because we don't know that at this point, that we can perhaps get some better control of those internally transmitted fungi. Hi. Um do these types of molecules have any uh, prior use in this application, and do the pests ever show any kind of resistance or tolerance over generations? Um, yes, uh, there is a body of literature on essential oils, and these are common components of different essential oils, <clears throat> particularly the caryophylline. That's been a, uh, a standard uh, test in a lot of the uh, for the, a lot of the insects. So yes, there, there is literature saying that this is an insecticidal property. This is a unique blend. So as we've talked about with human medicine, there is an entourage effect with, it, with pesticides as well. So we, we don't know what this specific uh, comp has done. This is the first testing of those. But some of these individually and also as components, usually, sometimes major components of other essential oils have been done. Um, usually with essential oils we don't see resistance developing because the different essential oils have diff different terpenes have different modes of action. So these are all sesquiterpenes so that might be a little uh, more risk of uh, developing uh, resistance but the fact is when we have these, with, these are really terpenoids, that when we have these oxygens at least with fungi we found that they're more fungicidal typically with these oxygens. And so we don't know exactly what the risk of resistance for this is. We have not done the experiment where we go back and uh, take the moths and, and make them and go back and, and start looking at generation after generation. I've been doing this work on insects. I'm a plant pathologist, so that was just beyond what I wanted to do. Hard to see out there. I can't see anybody. All right. <laughs> 